How we living, big dogs? Welcome back to the HQ. Welcome back to the channel. It's your man's Nicholas. Big dogs got to eat fantasy football. We are joined today by Dr. Jesse Morse of the Fantasy Doctors. We are talking everything injury related as it relates to running backs from last year. We had a lot of guys uh, that were injured for the entire year, for portions of the year, and we're going to talk about what it means for their 2019 fantasy football outlook moving forward. So guys like Darius Geis, guys like Dalvin Cook, guys like Leonard Fournette, Deonta Foreman. Um, what does it mean for Le'Veon Bell, who just sat out for an entire year and may have ballooned up and whatnot? So uh, Dr. Jesse Morse is here to explain all of those things to you guys, to me as well, because this is a topic I'm very interested in. Um, and I'm actually, to be honest, like very, very happy that we scheduled it for today because I was actually out at a, a St. Paddy's Day parade yesterday, like all day, 12 hours. So I'm, I'm not feeling my best. I'm, I'm very happy that you're going to be doing the majority of talking today. My first question to you before I even welcome you onto the channel, do you have any like secret hangover cures or tips? Pedialyte is fantastic. They make a, um, they make frozen popsicles if you don't feel like drinking. Okay. I drink Pedialyte with my protein shakes, but it's not the best tasting. <laughs> Ew. Um, a, a couple Tylenol and then the leave with a little bit of food if you can tolerate it and a lot of water is going to be your good choice. Okay. That's Usually you're dehydrated and you get a headache because you're dehydrated and because uh, your the blood vessels in your brain start to uh, vasodilate or get bigger. So when you uh, make them smaller, they they stop pounding. Okay, I've I've drinking about I've drank I've drinking I don't know about four water bottles already this morning. Is do you know if caffeine is caffeine bad for hangovers? No, it's wonderful because oh. it helps to uh, uh, helps to help those uh, blood vessels again. Okay. I mean, it may be the only thing that keeps you going. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm going to pass away. Well, you just you just get you just can't you just really tired and, and, and feel miserable. Gotcha. All right. Well, I appreciate that. I'm I'm gonna run to the store and get some Pedialyte right after this. Um, but yeah, thank you. Here's a here's an actual welcome to the audience. Make sure that you guys are following Dr. Jesse Morris because he will keep you updated everything, uh, fantasy football injury related. Uh, so go follow him on Twitter at Dr. Jesse Morse. Um, he does a lot of fantasy baseball as well. So thank you for coming on the channel, Dr. Jesse Morse. Um, you can, uh, if you want to give a, a quick background to the audience of, of exactly like what your specialties are and you know who you are as a person, you are free to take the stage. I uh, am a sports medicine uh, fellowship trained doc. I live uh, just north of West Palm Beach in uh, Stewart, Florida. Um, I do a lot of uh, orthopedics and, and sports medicine uh, in my clinic here. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I just finished up with the Miami Marlins uh, physicals. I thought that was uh, pretty sweet. Last year, I did the Phillies and the Blue Jays. Um, uh, two nights ago, I was a uh, fight doc for a big MMA event, 16, uh, ra 16 fights. I was cage side. That was pretty sweet. And I got some blood on my suit. Uh, so that, that was pretty sweet. Um, I'm not. I'm still uh, here at the Fantasy Doctors. We're kind of in transition from football to baseball, but still trying to kind of keep up with football. And uh, this is busy season for me with all the snowbirds down here. So just kind of dabble in a little bit of everything. I hear you. All right. Well, thank you for that for that intro. And let's dive into these running backs right now. First one uh, I have on the list is near and dear to my heart as a Falcons fan is Devonta Freeman. Now he suffered from. Um, a foot injury, a groin injury. It sent him to the IR in week five, I believe it was. So he missed the large majority of the year. And now he's kind of dealt with injuries for the last two years. And, you know, it, neither of those injuries might affect him necessarily going to 2019. You'll touch on that in a second. My concern with him is that he's such a violent runner and he has a, a small frame to him, right? Like 5'8", 205. So when you run that hard, for this long and get that many touches, you know, it's eventually going to add up on your body. He's not a 230 pound back that can do this year over year over year. So that's my bigger concern. He's also had like three concussions since 2015. So, you know, talk to me about Devonta Freeman. What is his injury risk? Because I think a lot of people are, you know, saying, oh, he's such a good value in like the third or fourth round because he has that elite RB1 upside that we've seen. I'm like, I don't really think he still has that value because he's a, he's a big injury risk in my eyes. What do you, what do you think about Devonta Freeman? So uh, the, the first question I asked myself is, how did Devonta Freeman's 2018 season go in one word? Awful. Yes. <laughs> right? I mean, basically, 
He had Big he facts. two games. He had rushed for a total of 68 yards for, on 14 carries. And you you spent what a second or third round pick on him? Mm-hmm. He, he probably well, he probably wasn't going first round this year. I mean, so here's the issue: he suffered an MCL sprain, which is in your knee, that cost him three games. He had a groin injury, which do not heal quickly, especially not for a running back. Uh, and and remember that he was coming back from a torn PCL, uh, which is also a, a ligament in your knee. Uh, in the off season, he basically spent the whole off season rehabbing. Yeah. Then he somehow got a bone bruise, or what we call bone contusion. Uh, on his foot, I don't even know how he pulled that off. So it's not very common. Um, and then that basically ended the season. So it's like, what do you need to do for you in 2018? Uh, yes, he got a year off, but I don't know. He's 27. He's my size, five eight. It's not exactly like I'd be wanting to run in with those monsters. You know, this is already 27. Sounds young, but in football years, that's like ancient. Yeah. You know? Uh, so it's like uh, I think he peaked, and unfortunately, the decline has begun. I mean, I think Edo Smith's going to take over. Coleman's gone. Personally, I let someone else worry about him. That's how I feel too. Now, where would you where would you say his? I'm assuming none of these injuries that he dealt with last year, because he was they they probably would have had him return to gameplay if they had made the playoffs. Um, so I'm assuming none of these injuries that he's had in 2018 are going to affect 2019. What would you say like his injury risk would be for 2019? So none of those injuries in particular are going to affect him per se in 2019. But in my opinion, he's a, definitely a higher risk. I mean, he, he had three different injuries over the course of what, what six weeks? Mm-hmm. All in the lower extremity. Uh, so it's like, I mean, in my opinion, he's... Uh, at least high or very high. Okay. Right? He's not quite Leonard Fournette, but he's pretty high. Okay, yeah, and and speaking of Leonard Fournette, we'll jump into him in a sec cuz last year like I remember getting off the interview with you and I was I was super high on Fournette and I remember you telling me like, you know, <clears throat> with Fournette's ankles, the injuries that he's had are not something that like heals and gets better. It's like those are those are something that kind of wears down over time and making him a higher injury risk. And I was so disappointed. Like when I heard that, I kind of just like sh- sh- shook it off and I was like, nah, I still love Fournette. But you were like, I, I you almost guarantee that Fournette was going to get hurt. You said, uh, you know, stay away from OBJ. You, you had a lot of players that you know you were right on with on, on the injuries. Now. Um, Leonard Fournette is, you know, it, it seemed like he dealt with a 10-week hamstring injury because he got injured early, tried to come back too early. Like you always say, and I try to push this point to people. It's like you need, 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 need to be fully, fully recovered if you're going to come back. Like I want to see at least three full days of practice before you're even thinking about getting back on the field. Not like, oh, he's questionable. He didn't practice at all. You know what I mean? So uh, is your take on Fournette pretty much exactly the same as it was last preseason and just that, you know, his his body is, is kind of wearing down and he's still a very high injury risk? Very much so. I mean, so here's the issue that a lot of these guys, uh, and I've seen this personally with a lot of the players that I've taken care of, uh, the, especially the professional ones, they think they're superhuman because they've always been pretty much the best player on their team and one of the best players on their team. So they're used to getting babied. They they basically can, they think that they, their timelines, regular medical timelines don't apply to them. Mm-hmm. So they feel like, oh, well, I, I, if you say it's two weeks, then I should be able to come back in a week. Well, that two weeks is two weeks for a professional athlete, not two weeks for a regular person. It'd be four weeks for a regular person. Or, you know, with not getting daily treatments and, you know, having all these modalities that most people don't normally have. Mm-hmm. So the issue with Fournette with me is that you drafted him as a top 15 back in 2018. He injures his hamstring and his lower extremities not once, but at least twice, technically a couple different times. Why? Because he rushed back too soon. The hamstring, as you know, in the first four to six weeks of the of the season, every season, this is what injure people injure. This is what they injure every year. You don't you don't hear about it much later in the season. Yeah. This is all at the beginning of the season. The problem is you cannot rush back too early on a hamstring because if you do, it will come back and re-injure, likely equally as bad. More most of the time, it's even worse. So then you go from a three to four week timeline to a six to seven week timeline on top of the original however much time it took you to get off right so um and i before i see a player get back on the field i want to see him doing full sprints 
in practice. Okay. I'm going to, but I want to. You cannot replicate full sprinting anyway. You just can't. You have to do it like you're like you're running the 40th the combine. Do it that way. If you if you re-injure yourself, then you're going to do it in a game anyway. If you don't re-injure yourself, you're ready. Mm-hmm. The problem that's the issue with these guys is they they baby themselves. You know, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, say, oh, I'm ready to go. They go out, they, they do 15, 20 carries, they re-injure themselves, and then they're out for another three, four weeks. And they just, the cycle continues. Right. Like, these stupid petty injuries, but they just, they, it leads to their whole season being lost. I mean, what happened if you drafted him in, in round one or round two, if you were lucky, round two uh, of, of 2018? You basically had no shot of making the playoffs. Your season was over. This right. isn't fantasy baseball where you have... 25, 30, 35 rounds where you can make up for that in, right. in a really long season. Can't do it in, in football. Football, you lose your first and second round pick, it's over. Mm-hmm. It's it. Or unless you got lucky and you drafted someone like a couple of years ago, Gurley and like another top five back right. that wasn't expected to be a top five back. And then you you got lucky because you had a guy that kind of made up for that. But that doesn't happen often. OBJ owners two years ago, what happened? You, you probably, there's a good chance you lost because of that. Yep. These guys have too much equity. You can't do something risky. And we'll talk about Todd Gurley in a minute. He's in the same boat. Mm-hmm. It's like, so he, here's here's his 2018 season. He played in week one, got injured. Played in week four, got injured. Played in week 10. You're, that, that basically, the season's over. Yeah. You already played nine season, nine weeks. Yep. Either, either you're six and three, five and four, or I guess it would be six and two. Uh, uh, you know, say uh, five and three, four and four. I mean, like, where are you at? If you're lucky and you're like eight and zero or something, but nine and zero, but I don't know. Yeah. So let me ask you this: like now, I mean, obviously people are really like their eyes are wide open to the the injury risk at Leonard Fournette is in fantasy football. Now his ADP has dropped down to you know third, fourth, fifth round pick. Is that is he someone that you're just like completely avoiding, knowing his history, or are you okay given the upside that maybe you'll use a fourth round pick on him? No, no. I think there's two guys with too much upside, and he's just too risky for me. If he was like, which isn't going to happen, but six, seven, eighth round pick, then I think that the, the risk is justified. Okay. But where you're going to have to spend up to get him because of his name? Because when he is healthy, we saw how ridiculously dominant he is. Mm-hmm. You'll never get him at, at a good value where it's worth it. Yeah. If this was like an auction or, or something like that, I mean, but most are snake drafts, and you don't you don't have that luxury. So if it, you know if he was like a six, seven, eighth round pick, and it was like your RB, your bench RB or something, that's no brainer. Yeah. But you're gonna have to draft him as as your second uh, running back. Uh, instead of uh, either a really good wide receiver two or maybe maybe around where a quarterback is starting to be taken, uh, you're there's too much risk. I mean, I think there's going to be guys who are younger, healthier, and 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 have a better chance to be successful. Yeah, that's uh, that, that's my take too. Like, I'm not going to touch him before. Like, maybe in one of my six leagues, I'll think about taking him in the fifth round if he drops there or something. But otherwise, I wouldn't touch him any earlier than that. And just going back to Freeman, one, for the audience members out there, Edo Smith is a fantastic late-round draft pick this year. Um, but two, who would you rather have? Because I think their their ADPs are very close right now. Devonta Freeman or Leonard Fournette, just in a vacuum this year? Oh, boy. Um, probably Fournette. Yeah. I, I really think that – I mean, he has age on his side. I just think Foreman, unfortunately, it just – it, his career is starting to go down the wrong way, and when that happens, you don't. I mean, Agent Peterson is a freak, but most guys, I mean, the, he's the exception. He's yeah. The rule. Yeah. You know, like, like, like we, how many? Yeah, how many guys do you see be elite, lose that elite status, and then come back? Almost never. Like you never, you never see someone have a slope where it's like this. They fall off and then get back to up there. Like the people that think he's going to regain his elite peak status, I, I think, are reaching really, really hard, and he's a much higher. Risk uh, than a, than a lot of people realize uh, with Freeman. Foster, remember how nasty he was? He came out of nowhere, and then he just kind of declined. I mean, you had um, <clears throat> a kid from uh, Kansas City who was ridiculous. Uh, he was so freaking fast. What was his name? Running back. Uh, yeah, a couple of years ago, uh, and then he just started declining. He went on a couple different teams. These guys just a couple of years, and then they're out of the league. That's just what happens. Yeah. Um, uh, 
I want to say, uh, I'll think of it in a minute. Yeah. But, it, um, it's just, uh, that's what happens. So it's like once it starts to decline, you have these young, hungry running backs with fresh tires, so to speak, that um, that are ready to take your spot. And yeah. That's just what it is. Let's talk about a, a couple of young backs, one of them being Deonta Foreman. Um, and, and I know last season, last offseason, he was an easy fade um, because there was the popular study that was done by one of your colleagues about athletes coming back from a torn Achilles. And that's what Deonta Foreman suffered back in 2017. And, you know, it, it was just a, a complete lack of explosion for any athletes that come back off of a torn Achilles. Um, and he came back, he, he ended up being active for, I believe, two games. He carried the ball like seven times for negative one yards, caught two passes for 28 yards or something. Now, tell me this. Like, I, I know uh, athletes have a lot of trouble coming back. Now that he's basically two years removed from that, uh, is Deontay Foreman still like a complete reach for anyone thinking that he might take over that Texans backfield? So, I actually kind of like him this year. Mm. I think he is, has sleeper potential. I, I'd have to talk to Celine, who authored that study, and see if they if they extrapolated the years. Did, did the the guys that did come back? How effective were they? Right. I, 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 I don't know the data. I don't know the specific data points on that, but. Um, the good news is that he made it back. Uh, only like a third or maybe 40% of these top athletes actually make it back. So like that's a, an achievement in its own right, especially for uh, like a running back. Um, it, I think it really also depends on, on Houston's line. I mean, uh, they were pretty awful last year, if I remember correctly. Yeah, they were pretty bad. They've they've gotten a little bit better. Um, Lamar Miller actually had like a somewhat decent year. So, I mean, but Lamar Miller is, you know... J- just a guy pretty much and if if foreman is healthy yeah that that's my thing is like if you can get back to us on uh on figuring out like if he did anything in terms of like second year uh studies or whatever that would be fantastic because if 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 the news is good that like you know once if if you've shown that you can make the return then you can get stronger or something if that's how that like comes back then foreman could absolutely be a great late round pick who's someone that could take over this uh this possible running back by committee i know they they say they're sold on lamar miller but they don't draft anyone i didn't hear any links whatsoever to the texans and signing a free agent running back so it seems like they're confident in foreman and i've seen some reports of bill o'brien talking about like he's seen his offseason workouts and they look good so um if being two years removed from the torn achilles tells you that you know he could be someone that plays in the NFL and does it at a high level or you know 90% of what he was in college then he's definitely a late round pick yeah I mean I definitely I'm still I'm in full baseball mode right now but <laughs> I think when football starts to roll around from my mentally me late July early August I think we'll have to kind of reevaluate and see where he's at with all the new players moving and uh new injuries that may pop up or whatnot okay. but i think he definitely uh could be a sneaky rb2 or a flex i think he definitely has that p- possibility i mean lamar miller is what he is we know who he is yeah uh, he's not going to change so it's like if foreman can can get healthy stay healthy and show some explosiveness i think that that that's a great sign Okay, cool. So let's let's dive into some some big name players. You you brought up Todd Gurley before. Now he had this weird end of season where we didn't know what was going on with his knee. I mean, you knew there was something going on because you don't bench Todd Gurley for C.J. Anderson in the playoffs if he's healthy. The reports come out that he has arthritis in his knee. Now I don't really know anything about arthritis. I feel like I have it in like nineteen different body parts, but that's another story. Todd Gurley arthritis. What exactly does that mean going forward? Is that easy to take care of, and will he still be able to play at a very high level? So he, oh, okay, okay. So he is not a top five pick for you, is he? No. Nope. So um, if you all have a subscription to The Athletic, I did an article, an interview or slash article last week, two weeks ago, uh, from the LA version, from the LA uh, Athletic, and it's basically talking about how challenging this is going to be for um, for Gurley to come back from. Oh boy! So here's the, here's the issue with arthritis. Why does he have arthritis in, in general? Because he tore his ACL in the past. Um, when you tear your ACL, you use there's about a forty to sixty percent chance you also tear your meniscus. Your meniscus is essentially the shocks for your knee. So think of um, driving, getting a car that say. 
brand new or, or five years old, um, and then you put three new shocks on it, but one of them is bad. One of them is still old. So when you drive down the road, the three tires, if they hit a bump, they may have a little, a little bump, but not bad. That one that's old, you feel it. Okay. And it's going to drag. That's the issue with arthritis and with meniscus, is that the meniscus, because what they do is they usually, uh, if you take off the top of the, the, the top bone of the knee and you look straight down, we have two semicircular rings. That's the meniscus. They're basically thick, fibrous cartilage uh, rings that uh, that basically prevent the bones from smashing into each other. Okay. Well, what happens is you can tear those, and, and and these don't heal in anybody. They just ha- they don't have a good blood supply. So if the piece is big enough, they will tr- uh, surgeons will go in and trim out the edge uh, and, and leave as much as they can, but trim out the edge and smooth it down. Now what happens is uh, because that edge is missing now, those bones start to smash. That's what causes arthritis. So the arthritis is, uh, is starting to develop in that area. And the issue is arthritis causes intermittent swelling, causes a throbbing, aching stiffness that gets better as you get going throughout the day, but never gets completely better. Okay. Never completely goes away. The issue is it's unpredictable. Normally, in, in patients who have this, I either give them a corticosteroid injection, um, or depending on how bad their knee is, I'll give them what we call a gel injection. Or if they're older and their arthritis is really bad, I start talking about a knee replacement. But not in someone who's in their late 20s. Right. So that's the issue is that you can't put steroids into this guy's knee every couple of weeks or every couple of months. That's not good for his cartilage. That's not good for his knee. So now you start talking about stem cell and PRP and these other types of injections. And yes, they really work. I do them in my office, but they're not going to make his knee pre-injury. It's just not. It's not going to happen. Jeez. So, so the issue is, yes, his knee may be good for seventy percent of the season, but when is that other thirty percent going to come? You know, it's like the issue is there's no good surgery to fix this and, and have him still play. There's no good procedure where you can go in and scrape out the arthritis. It doesn't exist. Boy. So the problem is, it's like you're hoping that it cooperates, but what if he go he bangs it up and then he has three four weeks where it's just not settling down. Yep. So if like something were to happen in the preseason and you know you're hearing quiet rumbles like oh Todd Gurley's sitting out you know resting his legs or whatever or if you know uh, he suffered some kind of minor knee injury and he'll be out for a week or two that's a huge red flag and you're immediately like oh it's starting now and it's gonna linger you know like so this is this is a very big deal. Yes, that's, this is the problem. I mean, and they owe him a lot of money. Yes. This is the issue with. Uh, ACL injuries with with meniscal injuries in athletes who so think of think of your knees as having uh, like tires they have they only have so much tread on them so if he's been a running back since he was I don't know, 15 or whatever he's what 25 I don't know just somewhere around there yeah yeah give so or take he's been running hard for almost 10 years yep he's probably run harder not in the past 10 years than most people will run their entire life so that those tires are starting to wear thin we don't get new tires those that's what we call a knee replacement so the issue is he doesn't have the luxury of being able to just change out his tires and start over again so he's got to make do so assuming i mean Gurley's not going to drop to the second round in any fantasy football draft if you have a back half of the first round pick say your pick eight pick 10 or something like that are you thinking about Gurley, or is he off your board knowing that he's going to have to go in the first round? Correct. He, he's just like Fournette, where I already know I won't be able to get a good value from him, so I'm just, I just fade him altogether. Okay, that is, that is fucking gold right now for my audience. You heard, you heard it here. Gurley is a fade in the first round. It's not a guarantee, but there's a very, very, very high likelihood that this affects his 2019 campaign. Todd Gurley, get him off your big board. Darius Geis. I love. I wish I wish Gurley the best of luck, but I just this is medicine. I mean, and yeah. you know, unless he defies the odds. Yeah. Unfortunately, that's just what it's going to be like. Yeah, and we'll we'll have to see what the Rams also do in uh, in the draft. You know, do they do they take a, a 
you know, a second day, a third day running back, I think that will also kind of speak to it. Um, so it should be an interesting offseason for the Rams altogether because they got a lot of stuff going on there. Uh, also, for the audience members out there, uh, we this is just the running back episode, but we are also going to get to a wide receiver episode where we break down uh, OBJ and, and Cooper Cup and, and guys like that. So uh, so stay tuned for next time I've, I got the doc back on here. Let's talk about uh, Darius Geis because he missed his entire rookie season. I love Darius Geis coming out. He was probably you know one of, if, if not my favorite back behind Saquon Barkley in this uh, in this class. He missed the entire year, of course. Adrian Peterson took over and did well. Um, so Darius Geis is, you know, rehabbing or, you know, almost done rehabbing. But there was some complications. I didn't read too much into the report because I didn't really understand what was going on. Uh, it, do we have to be concerned about Darius Geis's ACL tear? Or, or as fantasy owners, are we more just concerned about the Redskins offense overall? So here's the issue that I have with Geis. And not him in particular, just the situation that transpired. Okay. So, yes, he tore his ACL, and unfortunately that's becoming very common, like Tommy John and Major League Pitchers. Um, but it was delayed by infection. Uh, similar to his teammate, Alex Smith, who also had a ton of infections. Infections in a joint are really bad. I mean, infections in general are bad, but infections in a joint are really bad. Okay. So you can't put any hardware, you can't put any grafting material... Nothing in there until that thing is completely healed. And usually that's six to eight weeks, if we're lucky. If everything goes perfectly, it's maybe four weeks, but usually it's closer to six to eight. So not only can you not start rehabbing, you can't even do the surgery until two months after, hypothetically, if you injure, if you get the infection right away. That's why you won't see Alex Smith all of 2019 because of his infection. Mm-hmm. I don't. The issue with Geis is that he's getting delayed. He got delayed probably by at least three months. I mean, they're not going to tell you specifics, but um, roughly you're looking at about nine to twelve months after an ACL tear before you should be able to start cutting and that type of stuff. Again, Adrian Peterson is the exception at six months, but that's rare. Nine months is the rule of thumb, and twelve months is more realistic. Okay. So. If you started his call in August or, say, early September, that's perfect, right? I mean, that's basically 12, 12 months and he'd be back or maybe 11 months. But now you start talking about if he has an infection and what if he didn't have his graft put in until November? Now we're talking about 12, 9 to 12 months from November. Now we're starting talking about already into the 2019 season. Hmm. So Maybe that's why they re-signed AP. So that's, that's the issue is that you're going into the 2019 season like the Texans did for Foreman, where they know that he's not going to be ready. Right. I mean, they just keep they telling you, him, yeah. That's you know they can push him, but that's not. A, I mean, this is someone that you want to ride. You don't right. want to push him to to injure himself. So AP looked pretty good. I mean, in, in general, I mean, he for what you were expecting out of him, he performed quite well. Yeah. So he's not, on the bench. I mean, they didn't resign him to be on the bench. Yeah, and it's like with Keenum, they bring Keenum in, and obviously he's not their long-term solution. So they might be looking at 2019 as, you know, they're not like fading the entire year, but maybe they know just going in that it's not, you know, they're not real contenders. So that would make sense if, if they don't ride uh, guys like too hard. So another another guy who's uh, definitely a risky pick. So he'll be going in the third, prob- probably the third. I'm assuming his hype and his buzz will get high enough to the point where, where he'll, he'll start going within like, you know, the top 30 picks. So you're saying he's probably a fade that early. Uh, that early, yes. Um, if he he uh, is, is so I'm going to compare his potential in 2019 to Dalvin Cook's in 2018. Okay. So, in most people's eyes, Dalvin Cook disappointed. Yes. Right. For sure. I feel like he did anyway. Yeah. Um, that's how I feel like they're going to say, guys, is that ACL is that big of a deal. Okay. Unfortunately. So I mean, it's just like you want him to be a top ten back, but I just. I don't see it unless everything works perfectly and his knee just is amazing. So we're just, you know. So we're probably a year away from seeing the real Darius guys in the NFL. Okay. Correct. All right, so let's talk about Dalvin Cook since you just brought him up now. Disappointing in the sense that he had this hamstring injury that, you know, like Fournette, kind of lingered for the entire year. We did see him come back, though, towards the end of the year, and he looked really, really good. Uh, we have the new kind of coaching staff and this new offense going on in Minnesota this year that I think are going to ride 
the tails off of Dalvin Cook. He's excellent in the passing game. Um, I was looking at some of his numbers. He caught at least three passes in basically every single game that he was in. There was a five-catch game, a six-catch game, an eight-catch game. They love this guy. Latavius Murray is now gone. He's in uh, New Orleans. So, so you know, Cook is a guy that I'm getting higher and higher and higher on, but he's also dealt with injuries, you know, for both the years that he's been in the NFL. Now, are these kind of like fluky injuries? And if he doesn't get injured in like the preseason or something, can we, uh, you know, clearly expect a breakout from Dalvin Cook? Or are we worried about him being a high injury risk guy like Leonard Fournette? I think he'll be the top breakout guy of 2019. Love that. Mm. They, they, these guys take, yes, they perform in the year after ACL surgery. So Geis is 2019. But they don't, from what most people in the data most people say that it's the year after where they actually finally feel normal again. Awesome. I love to hear that. A lot of this is, uh, so uh, people, I've obviously never had one. I hope I never have one, but a lot of people who have had ACL reconstruction surgery uh, will say that out of 100% of rehab, quote unquote rehab, they say anywhere from 60 to 80% is mental. Okay. So this is not, I mean, you have to think about someone running full force. These guys can run full force, full speed, straight. That's not the concern. Mm-hmm. Straight is fine. You don't need really need the ACL for straight, so to speak. You need it for these random, unexpected cuts. You need it for, I'm going hard this way, and then all of a sudden I'm trying to avoid someone and go that way. That's what you need the ACL for, and that is what football is. So... The issue is these guys are not comfortable mentally knowing that that is what causes an ACL tear to go hard and cut on a dime like you're seeing a, a, a route runner go exactly where he knows he's going. Okay. Running backs don't have that luxury. They have to go where the defenders aren't. Right. So that's a lot of the times the year after is usually where they start shine if they as long as they still have healthy and everything falls in line they that's when they usually start doing better all right so we're smashing dalvin cook in the second round of every redraft league i think that's appropriate i mean i think uh depending on how their year shapes up they didn't really change much right their offense is pretty much the same besides murray as far as i can think of it i mean yeah they have uh they have not a new oc but the oc that took over for the last like three or four games of last year uh they they made him the full-time OC, I believe, and if you look at the run pass splits while he was the offensive coordinator there, it was very, very heavily in favor of the run, and you know, that's what they're going to want to do. Um, their defense is not the same as it's been for the last like five years. They're not going to be an elite defense anymore, which, you know, I don't think it is a tremendous effect on Dalvin Cook, but even if they need to pass the ball more and play catch up and stuff, Cook is, like I said, a- an excellent pass catching back. So um, if you're playing in any sort of half PPR, PPR league, Cook is one of those guys that, like you said, uh, and I've talked about this with some of my um, people that I've had on here with Dalvin Cook. He's like, he's he's probably, <clears throat> in my opinion, the guy that's getting drafted outside of the top five running backs. That you know, if you took everyone that wasn't top five back and let them be healthy for an, a full sixteen games, he's the most likely guy to finish as as a top three fantasy running back, in my opinion. Oh yeah, his data, his data is very solid. I mean, he's got. I know when he, when you look at the advanced metrics, I mean he's a lot of his stuff supports it. He's if he can put it together and stay healthy, he's an all yeah he's awesome. The sky's the limit. Great. So you don't really so you you say like these other injuries that he's had he's had are definitely not like predictive injuries for going forward. Hamstrings are are, are kind of unique, um, but the fact that he responded, but the fact that he listened, whether or not it had anything to do with him watching Fournette indirectly uh, <laughs> re-injure himself. Uh, I'm hopefully more athletes learn from that. Um, they, as long as he properly rehabs and properly keeps his hamstrings intact, running, doing his his Nordic, um, uh, Nordic cues and and, and 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 doing hill runs and that type of stuff. A lot of that stuff to protect those hamstrings. As long as he's good, I'm not concerned about the ACL. Yes, I'll talk about. Um, so the issue with the ACL in general is that after there is a significant, there's still a solid risk at about one, uh, between two years, within two years after having an ACL uh, surgery. Okay. There's a 30% chance of retear. 
Okay. okay. The, the, the the data obviously the, it's really hard to, to to do data on NFL players. Right. Uh, most of the data is either usually from a little younger, like seventeen, eighteen. But what we've learned is that there is a anywhere from six to nine percent uh, retear rate of the actual graft, the actual knee, the same knee, um, which is pretty good. Not it's not low, but it's pretty low. Uh, and then there's, but there's a 21 percent chance of a tear within two years of the opposite knee. Okay. So you said, well, how often does that happen? To Sean Watson, he did it less, maybe a little over two years after his first one. Okay. So Cook definitely, there's definitely a little bit of a risk. Maybe first round might be might be pushing it um, because you probably will be able to get him around. Yeah, in the second round, um, possibly even the third round in some drafts, because I think that's about where he was going last year, you know, uh, late second, maybe early third, if you were in uh, a more shallow league. So I wouldn't expect him to go much higher than he was last year. So I think, you know, first round, I, you know, after having this conversation, I'm like, I, I, I want to make sure that I've cooked in, you know, a few of my big money leagues. I, I might have to, you know, think about pulling the trigger in, in the first if I know I have some sharps, you know, uh, on the back end uh, of my pick. So cook a little bit of injury risk there. But I I, I think the upside is, is definitely work, worth it when you look at a guy like uh, Dalvin Cook and what he brings to the table. Let's talk about the last guy up on our list. And this is the Jets' new offensive lineman, Le'Veon Bell. Signs of fat, guaranteed contract. He got the money, probably not as much as he wanted, but... That's not what we're here to talk about. Le'Veon Bell, there's his reports that he ballooned up to 260 pounds. Um, he is now been out of football for a long time, right? He missed the entire 2018 season. I was looking up the numbers today. The last time he played was the divisional round playoff game against Jacksonville, 2017 season. By the time he steps on the field in September for the Jets, assuming he's ready to go for week one, he'll have missed 602 days of NFL football. That will be the, the time span of him not stepping on the field. So Le'Veon Bell is older for a running back. He has missed over 600, uh, 600 days of NFL football um, when he does step on the field in September. And now you have these rumors of weight. Now, I, I, I'm sure he'll step on the field at, you know, 235 or something like that. I'm sure he's working out a lot. But I feel like there's a lot of red flags here when it comes to Le'Veon Bell. Uh, what are your, are, are, do you have any concerns about him sitting out for so long? Do you have, obviously, if the weight things are real, if he steps on the field at 250, it's a, it's a huge risk. You're fading him anywhere in the first, second round, anything like that. But uh, talk to me about Le'Veon Bell. Like, what, what do you see here as, like, red flags and, and any, you know, opposition to it? Um, so here's my thoughts on Bell. Um, I think that... Sitting out for a year, as long as he didn't get too lazy, sedentary, injure his body in another way, um, will probably benefit him. Really? Okay. Why? 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 Because uh, he basically gave his body a year off from all the wear and tear um, and allow and, and, and indirectly secured himself financially. Um to allow him to get a couple more years. He has a very unique running style. That's why he's been so effective. Um, most of these guys, so I see him more as an Adrian Peterson longevity than some of your guys that last three, four years and then are done. You know, Inter I mean, interesting. He's already been in for four, five years or whatever it is already. I feel like it's been eternity. Um, so and financially speaking, obviously, none of the 99% of us will never fathom this amount of money anyway. So it's, it is what it is, but but we where we love to critique it. So um, here's kind of the way I, I look at it this way. Yes, he. So at the end of the day, he's trying to do what's best for him and his family, right? I mean, you you think and yeah. Right? Um. So the lifespan of a running back in the NFL is about three to four years on average, maybe a little longer nowadays. Maybe depending on if you're a top five guy or not. Yeah. So, he wants to secure as much guaranteed money as he can, right? Well, obviously, the Steelers offered this massive contract. I think it was five seventy or you know five yeah. seven million or whatever it was. Um, obviously, he declined that. Maybe he had to do it guar guarantees. Maybe he had to do it. He didn't like the the situation at hand. Whatever it have you, he turned down his fourteen and change fourteen point five. Uh, um, salary for 18 but here's what I, i'm going to play devil's advocate a minute okay what if week one he took that contract he played in, in 18 
what in week one, because he didn't technically have anything secured at that moment, moment in time, so he just stayed, took the one-year deal. What if in 2018, in week one of the NFL season, he tore his ACL? How much guaranteed money is he going to make in 2019? He'll get a one-year prove-it deal, probably. Maybe something small, like a two-year, $20 million, $7 million guaranteed or something like that. He just guaranteed $30 million. Right. So, yes, he lost money. Did I, did I, that is, there's no question about that. Yeah. But maybe it will end up being, he'll end up doing better in the long run and have a longer career because of it. I don't, I don't know. But either way, I, I don't think it technically hurt him as long as he stays in the shape that he knows he has to be in. This is not his first go around. He knows, you know, where, what to do. He knows how to how to pick the holes. He knows how to train appropriately. He will be a top five running back in 2019. Really, you're that high on him. I'm I'm more I'm not concerned really about him sitting out or concerned about the weight. My concern more so was just uh, the Jets' offensive line for one. They're adding pieces, but nothing major. Um, the Jets' offensive line. Adam Gase is the head coach. I think he he just did an awful job in Miami. He doesn't know how to use running backs. Um, so my concern is more of the situation than it is Le'Veon Bell, the player. So clearly you're not, you know, you you don't see a lot of risk in Le'Veon Bell from um, like an injury or, or sitting out standpoint at all. No, uh, he's paid. He's gonna. He's going to. Uh, he's gonna. He's gonna run there. I, I'm not worried about injuries with him. I'm not worried about uh, him sitting out anymore. Uh, I mean, I don't know why. There's nothing to sit out for. He's right. Already paid. Hey. Um, the. So, look at go back and look at Gase's running backs in a PPR format, or half whatever half PPR full whatever you want to call it, over the past couple of years. They're actually better than you think. The combined total, yeah. Uh, if you look at, um, who, um, so last year, what's his name? Um, who is the running back? Not Gore. Um, Kenyon Drake. Yeah, I'm so in baseball mode. I, all the football players are escaping me. I got you back. Drake, Don't worry. I think he finished 14th in PPR, I want to say. Somewhere around there. Mm, probably a little bit lower than that. But it was no show of consistency. I was looking at, you know, because Bell, the thing with Bell is that he was so good in Pittsburgh because that offense passed at such a high volume and threw to the running backs at such a high volume. My concern was, like, I was looking at the numbers and um, Bell had, like, five or six games in 2017 alone where he caught like five or more passes right like five or six of those I looked at the three years in Miami in which Adam Gase was the head coach and I think they had a total of like three or four individual games where a running back caught five or more passes now of course Bell got that money so he should be playing you know 90% of the snaps so maybe it is a situation where you just need to be like he's getting all the volume there so if you want to combine all the Miami running back PPR numbers and look at that as like what Le'Veon Bell could be as opposed to, you know, nitpicking the way I did. Maybe that's a smarter way. So so you're saying Le'Veon Bell is 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 a good pick and redraft. He's also it sounds like he he's um I'm not sure if you play any dynasty fantasy football, but he sounds like someone you could probably buy on the low in dynasty. Yeah, I mean I I, I mean I definitely think he's not as high as uh, I mean as your Saquon's but I would definitely probably take him over Gurley. Yeah, it sounds like I, I probably would too now. Would you take him over Dalvin Cook? Mm, I don't know. That'd be a close one. Okay. Uh, my suspicion is Bell is probably going to be cheaper than Cook. I think they're both probably going to go, yeah. The, I think they're both, they'll probably go if 12 teamers, I would say in, the, in both in the 10 to 15 range. Probably, yeah. yeah. It'll be, it'll be interesting to monitor. There's probably about five backs that I would take over him. Okay. Like, off, you know, I'm like, so what do you do with David Johnson this year? Mm. Uh, I'm waiting to see the quarterback situation. I'm a big fan of what Cliff Kingsbury is going to bring there. I could care less about from an NFL perspective, but I know from a fantasy perspective, they're going to be passing the ball at a very high rate, and David Johnson is going to be utilized. Do I think David Johnson is going to get back to what he was in 2017 or whatever, you know, the last full year that he really broke out? Uh, no, I don't. So I, I think David Johnson's name should be considered in, in the Dalvin Cook, Le'Veon Bell range. I think that's about where the conversation starts. Uh, I would personally take 
Dalvin Cook over David Johnson. Very close. I would put Le'Veon Bell. Ah, oh, man, it's a tricky situation. But John, David Johnson is going to have a better year than he did last year. Uh, but I wouldn't get my expectations up to the point where we're seeing, you know, the David Johnson of old. I mean, I think I think you have guys like Zeke, uh, Melvin Gordon, um, Saquon, uh, not in any particular order. Yeah. Um, and then after that, you kind of have to start thinking upside. I mean, those are your your, your workhorses. Is yeah. Is Bell going to be a workhorse? Presumably. He's got to be. Yeah. They got nothing else in that backfield, even. I mean, what Cannon Star probably still there, um, and that I I, I think uh, the other guys were are free agents. Uh, Darnold, I think, is actually going to be really good. And as a Patriots fan, that kind of scares me. But um, I think he's going to be really good. Uh, they have some talented wide receivers now. Or, you know, in general, they have some talented uh, uh, pass-catching tight ends. So uh, they actually may be decent this year. I don't think they're going to win the division. Um, you you don't say. <laughs> common things are common. Yeah. Um, but... but uh, We'll see. I think they're they're going to surprise some people. I think they're going to surprise me because I was pretty down on them. But I, I kind of agree with you. I think they're putting Loki a nice little weapons group together for Darnold. He finished the year very strong. I liked what I saw from him. If they could really upgrade that offensive line, I think they have the potential to be a very big sleeper team and compete with a, maybe a 500 record, possibly even a 9-7 and seven if you want to push it. Um, so, okay, that, that's, uh, that's a lot of really good info. And one guy I didn't, I didn't send over to you on the list cause he didn't really deal with a, a large injury. So you could just, you know, tell me what you know off the top of your head. You mentioned Melvin Gordon. Now, Melvin Gordon's a guy who's missed multiple weeks, like three, four weeks in almost all of his NFL seasons so far, but he's a guy who at his best when he's healthy is among the elite fantasy running backs. Um, is he someone you're concerned about from an injury perspective in 2019? Uh, not any more than it was in 2018. Okay. Uh, I always considered him a volume back, which is rare mm-hmm. nowadays. Um, but he kind of changed his style or, or proved that he wasn't just a volume back and actually did quite well. Yeah, and that he was like, good, yeah. Top two, three, everyone was every week. I mean, he was, like, ridiculous. Yep. So, I mean, I think that um, they're going to have more weapons besides uh, Tyrell. Uh, than last year, so I think that I don't really expect that to change. They still have a dynamic backfield. Yep. Um, so I mean, I think that uh, I'm not overly concerned about him. Uh, I'll look at him a little more as we get closer to season, but um, not not overly particularly concerning. Okay. Cool. Yeah, because he's someone that like you're gonna have the top guys go off the board. Um, I- I'm assuming in no particular order, it's gonna be Saquon, C Mac, Zeke, Kamara. Uh, and you know, I won't be taking Gurley after talking to you in the top five, but a lot, most leagues, he will be off the board yeah. within the first five picks. So it'll be those five. And like, I, I want to put Melvin Gordon as the number six, right. And grab him there at the six spot. But the injury concerns are a little, you know, they're a little risky, I guess, for the normal person who's just looking at it. If they're looking at the box score, they see that he missed multiple weeks. So, um, do you think, you think Melvin Gordon's a good pick at like the six back? Oh yeah. Yeah. I would definitely take, I mean, Consistency. If you miss out on on your other guys, I think that um, I think he's definitely up there. I take him over Gurley. I take him over pretty much anybody that runs in the eastern part of the country besides probably <laughs> Zeke, if you want to consider him, uh, and and Saquon. I mean Bell. I think I would still take Gordon over Bell, uh, okay. but I think it's not super far off. CMC is definitely higher than than Gordon, in my opinion, just because of his volume. Me too. Uh, but that's about it. I mean, I think it's definitely in the five to eight range. Cool. It's just spitballing. But, um, yeah, uh, that's all, all I got for you. I got to take off. Yeah. Uh, we will uh, do uh, some round of wide receivers in the near future. Yeah, we'll do some wide receivers. And then during the summer when training camps you know, come by and, and like, you know, football is in, in full effect. Uh, I'd love to have you on like bi-weekly or whatever your, your schedule permits. Um, but yeah, thank you for coming on, man. Tons and tons of valuable information from your side. I know it's only going to get better as you're diving more into football and as the season progresses. So um, thank you for joining us. 
Make sure y'all uh, go follow Dr. Jesse Morse on Twitter. That is his Twitter name. It's been kind of hanging on the bottom of the screen the entire time. Um, do you have anywhere else that you want the audience to listen to you, watch you, uh, find you on, on uh, the interwebs? Right now, we're uh, kind of laying low. We just put some stuff out uh, intermittently on Twitter, uh, on our website, fantasydoctors.com. And then on some YouTube page, our YouTube page, we do some intermittent stuff with basketball and baseball, uh, but really not uh, much content for football right now, but that will start to ramp up. Uh, but just kind of plug us in, and then uh, if you have any questions or, or anything, just shoot us out, and uh, I will happily answer them for you if I, if I can. Awesome. So I'll link all that stuff down below for you guys. Uh, make sure you hit that thumbs up button if you enjoyed the video. Make sure you subscribe to the channel if you are new. We're covering everything 2019 fantasy football from now and through uh, your championship game, which hopefully we will help you get there. I'll see you all on uh, whatever next episode is. Peace.